Sarah Lee party size gatto. Now, less bread for more of a cake. You'll find them in good freezer cabinets this Easter. I have bred 26 British Sheltie champions and I've been using pedigree chum for more than 10 years and it's still a good value now that it's always been. I consider it first class quality. It never varies and never changes. Pedigree chum is solid goodness. It's full of meaty nourishment. They clear their plates with gusto. The plate is licked clean. There's nothing in my view that can better pedigree chum. I recommend chum. I've done it before and I'll do it again. It's first class value for money. Step into Texas now. Look for these free paint offers this bank holiday. Texas, the big one. Do you suffer from painful joints? Feel frayed at the edges, generally unfit? Then take a Black & Decker woodworker. You'll look better. You'll gain confidence. You'll find yourself doing things you thought impossible. Yes, woodwork need never get you down. Because the new Black & Decker Woodworker cures 99% of all woodworking headaches. The new Black & Decker Electric Woodworker. Available now without prescription. Levi's 10.95, Bianco Italia silk shirt 7.95, Lee Lois Wrangler Peter Golding, all quality labels at Lee Sale, Oxford Street, next to Tottenham Court Tube and opposite Victoria Tube. For nine generations, my family have blended the world's finest teas, like English breakfast, famous for its full-bodied flavour, Salon, picked high on the hillsides, has a delightful bouquet, and Earl Grey with a subtle taste as timeless as China itself. Twinings know the secret of fine teas, because we set the standard other teas are judged by. Yes, sir. Uh, I've got the boss coming for dinner. Ah, red or white? Oh, white, please. But not too sweet. Light and crisp? Oh, yes, please. Price, sir. Not too dear. But here's the boss. <laughs> so that's a white, light, crisp, good value quality wine. Mmm. Bola. Very wise choice, sir. Bola. Thank you very much. Bola. Bola. A choice wine and a wise choice. Tomorrow, St. Paul's Cathedrals are setting for a gala concert of sacred music by Duke Ellington, hosted by Rod Steiger and Douglas Just Fairbanks one. Jr. and starring Tony Bennett. Just one. Ain't but the one good Lord above, ain't but the one great God above. Including top jazz musicians Stan Tracy, Kenny Baker and Jack Lussier. And the superb voices of Phyllis Hyman, McHenry Boatwright and Adelaide Hall. The choreography of Wayne Sleep. Sacred music of Duke Ellington is tomorrow at 10.20 here on Channel 4. Well, if you're following tonight's programmes in TV Times, you should note that Anthony Howard's What the Papers Say is at the earlier than build time of 5 past 12. Time now for Vision Cinema. <laughs>
Tonight, we report on African cinema, as seen at the 8th Fesparco Festival held in Ouagadougou last month. But first, we look at the work of the German director Hans-Jürgen Sieberberg, whose four-and-a-quarter-hour film version of the opera Parsifal opened in London earlier this evening. The films of Hans-Jürgen Sieberberg have hardly been seen in England, yet they are probably the most visually distinctive and stylized works of the new German cinema. Sieberberg worked in TV documentary in the 60s and came to the attention of world cinema audiences quite dramatically with his first major film, Ludwig Requiem for a Virgin King, in 1972. Sieberberg is a single-minded figure who thrives on the controversies he creates. Though he lives in Munich, the major centre of German film production today, he's isolated himself from his fellow filmmakers. I hate this city. I can't do and birth, a conservative man. By every crime, you can see it. I mean, veranlagung and childhood. Lebe die Berge, die Waldluft, Pferde. Ich liebe Richard Wagner, Edgar Allan Poe, den Schriftsteller. Und ich liebe die Nacht, die mystische, unerklärbare. Und glaube an die Unsterblichkeit der Seele. Sieberbergs Films have had a series of protagonists. Ludwig, the Mad King of Bavaria, Karl May, the writer of Pulp Fiction, Winifred Wagner and Adolf Hitler. He sees them all as central figures in the German culture of the last century, united by the search for a lost paradise. One man's influence is common to them all, the composer Richard Wagner. Aus Parsifal baue ich mir eine Religion. Was der Nationalsozialismus will, umschließen alles die Werke des Meisters. Und ein Zitat von Rauschning in seinem Gespräch mit Hitler. Hitler erkannte keine Vorläufer an, mit einer Ausnahme, Richard Wagner. Also betonen möchte ich, dass es ein Wunsch Adolf Hitlers war, nach Wahnfried äh, kommen zu dürfen. Und er in tiefer Ehrfurcht und Liebe, möchte ich beinahe sagen, zu Richard Wagner äh, erfüllt war. Das fing schon in seinen Linzer Jahren an, indem er als junger Mensch auf dem Stehparter vom Linzer Theater sich mit Begeisterung den Lohngrin und den Rienzi angesehen haben, hat oder angehört hat. Und seitdem war er wohl Wagner verfallen. Am Rot, den Kopf nicht klar. Du jagst jetzt aus dem Golden und die darf mir gedulden. Gebt mich doch endlich wieder frei von den alten Kuchenweibern und Geldsäcken mit ihrem Kult. Ich gehöre der Jugend, der Revolution seit 48. Ich habe es geschafft gegen die alten Kulturspießer mit eigenem Haus und sechs Stunden Vorführzeit. Ein musikalischer Underground im 19. Jahrhundert. Ich will schon elend, dass du bleibst schön, dass zwei, drei Personen sind und deine Wohlbund. Erst wenn Niki de Saint-Paul und Tim Geil, Werner Schulter mit Nathaniela Montezuma und Ernst Fuchs den Ring machen, bin ich wieder erlöst. After a seven-hour film on Hitler, what could Sieberberg do next? It was quite clear that after the Hitler film, I was at the point of uh, maybe uh, Germany 45. That means a certain end of things which developed. Maybe he should confront Wagner himself, this little man whose presence still looms over the whole of European culture. 
He would need to confront this Wagner on his own territory, perhaps even inside his head. One means would be through filming Wagner's last great opera, Parsifal. I think if I would uh, try to characterize it, I think it is uh, more something classic, something that is actually forbidden. It's not possible in our days. It's something that is um, like a miracle. So it is, in a, in a certain way, the contrary of things we are used to in our days. But not, not uh, going backwards, I think, with the help of my techniques and thinking it's something uh, going far, maybe uh, forward. Or forward, I don't know, maybe the time doesn't go forward. Parsifal offered Sieberberg more than the possibility of interpreting an opera. It enabled him to continue his solitary excavation of the suppressed, irrational aspects of German history. He looks at past, present and future simultaneously, trying to confront myth and reality, the rational and the romantic. He reduces Parsifal's central Christian theme in order to refocus it in a decaying Europe, suspended in time. Wagner's Parsifal was a sacred music drama set in medieval times around the Temple of the Holy Grail. It is a pious story of an innocent fool, Parsifal, who defeats the demonic Klingsor, heals the wound of Amfortas, the keeper of the Grail, and brings redemption to the seductress Kundry. <laughs> was an ambiguous opera, interpreted both as a Christian devotional work and as a pre-Nazi racialist tract. It has usually been staged with caution, but Sieberberg brushes away the cobwebs and opens up its complexity. Perhaps Wagner himself would have approved. And so we entschlossen wir uns zu einer Parsifal neu inszenierung im Jahr 33. Das hat meine Schwägerinnen aufs Äußerste empört. Also wie könnte ich Kulissen, auf die das Auge des Meisters beruht, habe, zerstören und nicht mehr bringen und so weiter und so weiter. Und sie leiteten eine große Aktion ein, eine große Petition. Man solle also den Parsifal lassen, wie er war. Eventuell also rekonstruieren, aber unter keinen Umständen eine Neuinstitution machen. Tietchen war damals mit mir der Ansicht, dass wenn wir Wagner gefragt hätten, was wir tun sollten, dass er niemals für eine Wiederaufnahme der alten Dekoration gewesen wäre, sondern unbedingt für etwas Neues. Normally we think Wagner is always overwhelming noise and uh, big um thunderstorm of feelings, but uh, maybe that is not the only or the right Wagner. So I followed the other lines, which he asked for himself. But of course, I'm not somebody who was only uh, the assistant of 
his masters this way Wagner was not my master he is a master and uh, my intent was to continue uh, 100 years later where he stopped so if you add a world of pictures to this world of sound it's something uh, that uh, fills it up with new ideas and you have to be good to work with somebody like Wagner Sieberberg's whirlpool of images is certain to infuriate Wagner purists. There is no pretense of reality. Sieberberg has practically reinvented the film studio as a private world where disparate ideas can be brought together. His tour de force was to stage the opera within a gigantic set of Wagner's death mask, which itself becomes the landscape of the film. Uh, when I started the party, well, there was never a question to do it uh, somewhere else than in the studio. But uh, somebody like me was uh, prepared uh, from my other films in this technique. So I was a man from film, but not from stage, going into the studio, but knowing something about the conditions of stage two. So this combination maybe was good uh, for the music, because I think the music needs this artificial world. If you are outside, it's, I think, the contrary. There are no walls, it's always open, but it closes the fantasy. But of course, the aesthetic of the opera is very, very, very artificial. And so you need something for the optical part, very artificial, if you produce the whole work of an opera. So I, I thought I was able to use, uh, as the world where it happens, the head of Wagner himself. So it's personalized. Sieberberg uses a technique of front projection, which is technically difficult to set up, but enables him to create stark juxtapositions in his images. It's really a spiritual way of using history in pictures. Technically, I thought now it's done after the Hitler film. But in the past, well, there were some new possibilities. For instance, four screens in combination and with a wandering camera between. So it was really something new. Some of the staging is obviously theatrical. And the use of simple stage devices leads us back into history and allows Sieberberg to surprise us further, provoking questions, making connections. Sieberberg strips away naturalistic elements to reveal the essence of the drama, using symbols as a potent visual shorthand. The relationship between what one sees, feels and hears disrupts one's expectations of Wagner's opera. I think that it's not so difficult uh, as it seems to be, because if you really look upon the visual things uh, in this uh, Passival film, there are not so many um, details you cannot find out. It's, it only seems to be uh, maybe a little bit uh, strange, but uh, 
at the end it doesn't matter if you know uh, certain things where for instance the spear comes from uh, it's interesting if you know and it's something more if you know but if not it's only a spear like others but if you don't know it doesn't matter you see pictures you have to to entertain your your spiritual uh, adventures um, and so I, I feel it by by showing certain things where you can look upon if you hear. The whole thing is at the end an adventure in yourself. It's a myth uh, of the soul. So as I think that the, the myth of this century, uh, of the 20th century, is uh, the soul of man. That's not a legend uh, of middle age. It's something very near to Freud. So things come together. Freud, technique of cinema, science of this century, and a new, maybe a new idea of myth. Characteristically, Sieberberg challenges the very meaning of Wagner's pivotal redemption theme. During Kundry's attempt at seducing him, Parsifal magically splits into two figures, one male and one female. It's an extraordinary effect that is liable to produce more critical interpretations than the whole of the ring cycle. Wir hatten früher hier buchstäblich viel weniger Probleme. Ich weiß nicht, es, es ging alles viel glatter und ich meine, es wurde nicht so viel diskutiert. Und ich meine, es, das, was Wagner angeordnet hatte, war eben das, was eben befolgt wurde. Und ich meine, heute, da, da zergliedert man ja ein Kunstwerk. Wie Sie früher, wir haben, wir haben das Kunstwerk gehabt und genommen, wie es war. Und haben nicht versucht, da nun sozialpolitische oder was weiß ich, oder zeitliche Probleme oder sowas hineinzutun. Wie Sie, das, das kannte man früher gar nicht, das machte man nicht. Das ist jetzt erst seit dem, seit dem Zweiten Weltkrieg aufgekommen. Wie Sie, dass die Leute alle intellektuell an die Dinge herangehen, nicht? Und dann einer versucht also das hineinzudeuten und einer versucht das und einer versucht das. Und wir haben eben, wir haben diese Probleme nicht gekannt. Some of the cast are used like the static figures in a German romantic painting isolated ambiguous symbols on the edge of reality. The cast, a mixture of singers and actors, all mime to an expressive pre-recorded music track. They do not react whilst another is acting. Reactions are saved for afterwards in the gestural style pioneered by Fritz Kortner, the great German actor of the 20s, whose aim was to let the soul reveal itself through the use of the body. Normally, people don't like the, 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 the appearance of, the, of these people because normally a young lover is uh, on stage nearly 60 and the fat old woman uh, is in the story a beautiful little temptress. And so I thought, why not to do it in the best way? That means make a montage, uh, that means be free to choose the voice as that we want, and the body. But that follows the idea a little bit of puppets, because the puppet is a body, is a mechanism, optical mechanism of something that has to be shown, and the voice comes from somebody else. So I, I mixed singers and actress, where the singers were as I wanted them. Edith Claver, acting Kundry, studied the work of Kundry's singer, Yvonne Minton, and rehearsed using video prior to the filming. Watch her erupt into anger at Parsifal. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wagner was one of the most radical dramatists of his age. He aimed for the total art form, the fusion of music, words and staging. Sieberberg's combination of these elements makes different demands on its audience. Very often I think that, um, especially in Germany, the people have lost not only their identity, but with it their curiosity to learn and to know things. So they cannot follow, they feel uh, lost, and uh, they are. Um, what, what can I do? And it's not only um, the knowledge of things you can read or which are taught, it's uh, the fear to touch certain things, because in the details things I uh, in invent or put in are not so difficult. But of course, my question for art or intention is uh, that it is not something that you can, after using, throw away. That would be uh, the artifact of consumer society. I think it's something to keep, to uh, see and hear again and again. And um, if you intend this, then it has to be in a certain way enigmatic. It has to be, uh, it has to keep secrets. So very often people get very nervous because today they are, everything becomes to them so easy in uh, consuming that they feel not well when there's something hidden or something they don't get immediately for cheap money. But that's the price of lasting history, and uh, they have to pay to themselves too. Wagner created Parsifal for one stage alone, his own at Bayreuth. Even so, he was dissatisfied with the banal effects of the first production. During rehearsals, he joked, having invented the invisible orchestra, I wish I could invent the invisible stage. Yet, in many ways, Wagner's dramatic ambitions anticipated the possibilities of the cinema. Now, Sieberberg continually reinvents the visual aspects of the drama and breaks through the reverence and piety that a century later still inhibit many operatic stagings of this work. So now I have to find my audience. I go around the world, uh, from country to country, from town to town, place to place, occasion to occasion, from film to film. Uh, it's like uh, the wandering Jew uh, going around with his burden uh, of films. But on the other hand, um, it gives a certain freedom. for something completely different. The vibrant new cinema of Black Africa, as seen at the Fesparco 83 Festival.
For nine days in February this year, Ouagadougou, capital of Upper Volta, played host to Fespaco, the eighth Pan-African film festival. One of the continent's poorest countries, Upper Volta is also one of the most welcoming. Each filmmaker and every corner of the continent is greeted in the Fespaco song, and most warmly, Usman Semben, Africa's best-known filmmaker and president of this year's jury. The first prize announced, the Umar Uganda Award, goes to Sanu Kolo of Upper Volta for his first feature film, Pawego. This prize commemorates the death in 1981 of Umar Uganda, Niger's most popular film director, and is awarded to an up-and-coming director. It is one of a dozen cash prizes for which 13 features and 10 short films from 13 African countries were in competition. The jury of the 8th FESPACO has discerned the talent of Yalenga in the film Finier. Winner of the 1979 Grand Prize for his film Bara, Suleiman Sisse from Mali is arguably the most important of the new generation of African filmmakers. The grand prize is presented by Captain Thomas Sankara, the new Prime Minister, who attended several screenings and showed great interest in the festival. Finier is about young people and the various forms of authority they come up against, both the authority of patriarchs in the family and the authority of government. Sisse explores this theme through a love story between two university students, Ba and Batru. Batru is the daughter of the bourgeois military governor. Ba's grandfather used to be a chief, but is now reduced to poverty. The two students join in the struggle against the corrupt exam system, a struggle which indeed did happen recently in Mali. Here, Ba and his friends have been sentenced to military discipline as punishment by the governor. We asked Sisse what was the relationship between events in Finye and the actual events in Mali. When I first wrote the script, there was no movement of this kind in Mali. These were things I felt myself and which I wrote into the script. Well, when I had finished the script, the events happened in Mali. They happened as I had written in my script. Given that my script was being overtaken by events, I was obliged to readapt, to rewrite the script to bring it up to date. That's what led me to present it in the form I did. Batru's father, the governor, is equally intransigent at home. He is a Muslim and has three wives, but he can only maintain peace between them by being as repressive as he is in public.
Siapa dulu yang kengar dengan kita berapa hari ini? Hari ini boleh nampak kita kira dulu yang aku mahu. Buang ini. Ida mana? Batu beri ini mana? Nampak dulu yang mana? Ani awal dia dulu. Niang kali beri mana? Alai ni niang mendulu lah nego kapan ni babi jono tay? Aka perubahan lah. No makak aku lulus agak tua dana. Tapi kita tidak. Many African films defend traditional values. We asked Sisse if he shared this position. Well, that's difficult. It's been assumed that a return to our roots was what would have saved us. I don't deny the traditional values, no. But I think that in our time we need to create something useful from these traditions. That starting from these traditions, we should go beyond them. As long as we don't move out of this framework, it is clear that we'll always be stuck at the same departure point. So therefore, tradition is a very good thing, but we must go forward. Africa has need of other horizons. That's a reality. We can't rely on our tradition solely. There's no country which doesn't have traditions, but each one has known how to use their customs and cultures in order to make a leap forward. And it is up to the African to do the same. There's no need to shut ourselves up in a ghetto, whether it be a cultural ghetto or another kind. It is utterly useless in any case for the evolution of our countries. The Fest Paco is not a festival, let's say like Cannes or Venice, uh, with parties, with, very lux with luxury, with uh, snobbish people sometimes. For me, it's a vital festival. It's a festival with, with, where a lot of filmmakers, which are very, uh, which are, who, who are spread all over a very big continent, it's, a, it's the only opportunity for them to meet every two years and to exchange ideas, exper experiences, and to, uh, to try to, to go in the same direction. In a public discussion, Sisse is questioned about the theme of drugs in Finier. Il faut, il faut dire les choses telles qu'elles sont. Il ne faut pas avoir peur de s'exprimer. C'est ce qui m'a poussé à montrer ces différents états de, 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 de la drogue, si vous voulez, dans ce film. Alors, le camarade... Debates with the public and with other filmmakers are a crucial part of Fespaco, not least because outside the festival, African audiences have little opportunity to see films from their own continent. La culture est aussi importante que les autres secteurs. Vous ne pouvez pas développer la santé si les gens n'ont pas conscience des fléaux qui, qui sont là, le virus. Les films peuvent servir à ça. Donc je ne souscris pas du tout, moi, à ce genre de raisonnement. Je voudrais qu'on considère la culture comme autre chose qu'on en fait. Il faut aussi que notre public apprenne à se libérer un peu pour essayer de, de suivre un peu les cinéastes. Je ne dis pas d'accepter tout ce qu'ils font, Parce que forcément, il faut qu'il y ait un échange donc des critiques pour qu'il y ait amélioration. Mais j'ai l'impression que notre public est, est un public qui n'évolue pas. Il y a un certain type de films que ce public a l'habitude de consommer. On les connaît, c'est les films européens, c'est les karatés, c'est les films policiers, qu'ils comprennent, qu'ils lisent à la perfection. Et puis il y a un produit nouveau sur notre propre territoire qui est le film africain en tant que tel. Et il faut que un effort soit fait au niveau du public pour apprendre à lire ce produit, à lire ces nouveaux films-là. Je crois que c'est là l'effort qu'on doit demander au public également. Upper Volta has done more than any other African country to foster cinema. Hosting Fasbaco is only one element of this exceptional story. The two Voltaic features in this year's festival both won prizes. The university houses a UNESCO-sponsored film school to which students from all over French-speaking Africa are sent and Upper Volta was the leading country in the attempt to liberate cinema screens from foreign control. In 1970, there were six cinemas in the country annually showing some 400 films distributed by the major European and American companies. Because the government had no control over the exhibition circuit, it decided to nationalize the cinemas. This provoked an immediate boycott by the foreign distributors, but since African production could not fill the demand for films, the cinemas were closed while the dispute continued. Eventually, a compromise was arranged. A state structure was established, and the tax income from cinema exhibition increased 14-fold. This meant that the government was also able to set up a national production office, 
of which Gaston Cabaret is the director. His film, Vend Cooney, is its most recent production. We asked Cabaret why he chose to set his film in the golden age before colonialism. I think, first of all, it's because I am myself a historian. I did history before studying film, and also because I am interested in what we were. It is clear to me that for historical reasons, reasons of historical interconnections, the African cinema, which was born after independence, became immediately involved in the struggles for cultural and political freedom in Africa. Therefore, it was a cinema directly and in a practically obligatory way at grips with the conflicts of cultural and political interests which followed independence. The foreign powers which were in Africa had left, but thanks chiefly to the cinema, they remained by means of a domination which was even more insidious and sophisticated than before. It was natural, therefore, that for a decade, many films should have dealt with these crucial problems. But I wanted to set Vend Kuni outside of this context because I think that outside of colonization we were, and to a large extent we still are, well, let us say, we still live a certain cultural entity. And I wanted to deal with this part of ourselves, which in my opinion, has not been affected by colonization, despite the traumas it made us suffer. The story of Vend Kuni is a simple one of a boy found abandoned, unable to speak, and without memory. He is adopted by a family and is befriended by their small daughter, played by Rosine Yanogo, who won the prize for the best actress. The film also won the prize for the best photography. I'm 
We are afraid that someday, maybe like in other third world places like India or uh, let's say Egypt, uh, the, the bad commercial cinema will take over <laughs> the other, the vital cinema. But I, in fact, I'm optimistic. Uh, all the, the, this big fight the African filmmakers made during 20 years and which not known at all in the world, it cannot disappear like that. And even what is um, good, even the private people who are producing films now, like Sinafrique in Ouagadougou, are producing the same kind of film. I mean, engaged film, film uh, which express uh, Africa, and not bad, bad commercial films. So maybe there is some hope. It is not surprising, perhaps, that a privately run film studio was built in Ouagadougou. Sinafrique opened in 1981 at a cost of one and a half million pounds and is now equipped with everything but a film laboratory. The initiative was greatly welcomed since, even with an increased tax income, state facilities, both in equipment and financing, are still extremely limited. Sinafrique, on the other hand, lacks the skilled technicians that work for the state production office. So clearly, cooperation between the private and public sectors is both inevitable and desirable. Pawego, Sinafrique's first feature film, is intended to be commercially viable, but despite the obvious constraints this imposes, such as having the dialogue in French rather than a local language, Sanu Kolo, the film's director, believes that the entertainment formula is the right one. I prefer this formula to the cinema, the cinema didactic. Let's say I prefer this formula to that of the didactic cinema of a cinema which bludgeons you with ideology and politics, of that cinema, let's say, which is very heavy and intellectual. I prefer entertainment because it's the best way of communicating with the public. The public, especially here, the public very much prefers to laugh over even the most dramatic scenes than to cry over them. Therefore, it's better to lead them to laugh and to think about things afterwards than to do things differently. And above all, the object of the film is to be commercial. So it was better for me that it was a film of that kind. And I think that's also one of the reasons it was produced, for its commercial popular side and all that. So if it works well, so much the better. It means I didn't go wrong. decides to leave his village in Upper Volta to look for work in the Ivory Coast. With him, he has to take Pogby, a girl from the village, to the fiancé she has never met. On reaching Mogadougou, she tries to run away to meet the boy she really loves. Pogby! des problèmes. Mais si tu voulais pas partir, fallait dire ça à ton père. Maintenant, allons-y. Tu m'échapperas plus. Here, Bila catches her, but later she does manage to escape. This sets off a whole chain of dramatic as well as comic consequences when Pogby, unused to city life, gets lost and is taken to the police station accused of soliciting. Que faisais-tu hier à 2 heures du matin dans la rue? Oui? Ah, François, j'avais justement besoin de toi. Comment ça va, mon cher inspecteur? Ah, tout doucement. 
Et toi Oui, ça va. La famille Oui, ça va. Madame Bien. Bien, tu permets là juste le temps que je classe cette affaire de vagabondage. Tu te racontes cette fille n'a aucune pièce sur elle. Et on la trouve comme ça, paf, dans la rue à 2h du matin. Ton nom Attends, Dico. Il me semble que je la connais. Ah oui Et si, je la connais très bien. Dans ce cas, mademoiselle, vous êtes libre. Mademoiselle, oui. vous m'attendez dans le couloir. Euh, oui, François. Comment t'appelles-tu Orbi Kabouri. Ah, joli nom. Mais au fait, quel âge as-tu Monsieur, je vais descendre. Non, Orbi. Tu t'en fais pas. N'aie pas peur. Je ne te ferai aucun mal. Now, uh, in 1983, it's too late. It's too late for uh, a new cinema to become a very spread uh, cinema and to become a big industry. Uh, now we are the era of television, the era of video cassette, of satellites. And uh, I think African cinema will be a cultural cinema which will be, in the best case, supported by uh, the money coming from the, the other films. You know, uh, uh, let's say like the art, art and essay uh, f films in, uh, in the world, uh, a kind of cultural cinema which, will, in the best case, cover its expenses, but not make super profits and uh, uh, invade the world. No, I don't think so. But, well, if we reach the point we are fighting for since 20 years, I mean, uh, making very good products which reflects African realities, African culture, and reach the public, I think that's enough. When a citizen of a country may see himself on the screen and not be uh, always somebody who, who, are, who, are, who are eating <laughs> images coming from outside, like it's the case now, it's enough. It's not a question of profit. It's a question of morality. The All India Talkie season continues on foreign Sunday afternoon at one o'clock with Diva, the story of two brothers on opposite sides of the law. Next tonight, Anthony Howard, the presenter of Face the Press and journalist with The Observer, tells what the papers say. Is your lucky star in TV Times this week? It might be. You're a winner if your number comes up in the £50,000 star numbers game. It did for Mrs Evans of Ascot, Mr Stewart of Nottingham, Mrs Benford of Kempston. And it could for you. So look out for your star number in TV Times, with details of eight days' programmes on ITV and Channel 4, including the entire Easter weekend from Good Friday to Easter Monday. So much more than TV Times in TV Times magazine. This is Channel 4. Time now for another look through the many opinions and stories culled from this week's press in What the Papers Say.
This week, what the papers say is presented by Anthony Howard, deputy editor of The Observer. Good evening, or to be more accurate, good morning. I suppose one of the compensations for appearing in this late, late, late slot is that we don't have to feel at all inhibited. Let's start then with Randy Andy, the bull of Barbados. Lay's Majesty, well, listen to what Miss Anne Robinson had to say a whole week ago on what I take to be the Miller's family page. Why the Queen must curb the Playboy Prince. Miss Robinson, plainly shocked to the core of her being, was in no mood to mince her words. Her column, decorated with an old mystique photograph, complete with suggestive caption, Andrew. Insatiable.